Hello and welcome to the video accompaniment for chapter 5, section 5 of our text. In this one we're talking about cardinalities of sets. Now I'll be honest with you, this is probably my favorite topic to teach uh, because I know when I learned uh, this stuff when I was an undergrad, um, it just blew my mind. I thought it was so cool and so neat um, and now I get to teach it and that's just, it's super fun for me. Um, so I'm hoping to impart a little bit of that uh, that attitude on to you. I know not all of you are going to find it super fun. Some of you are going to maybe find it a little bit confusing. That's okay. Uh, and, and maybe for some of you, it'll blow your mind too. Um, that's my hope anyway. Anyway, let's get down to a little overview of what we're going to be doing in this video. Uh, we'll encounter these terms denumerable, countable, and uncountable um, as descriptors for sets. We'll uh, apply our definition of same cardinality to our infinite common sets of numbers. Remember we defined same cardinality in the last video. This meant there was a bijective function between the two sets. And we'll be able to determine when one infinite set is bigger than another infinite set, right? In probably most of your lives, maybe some of you have heard this before, but for most of you, um, infinite sets are infinite sets. Infinity is infinity. There can't be anything bigger than infinity. Well, I'm here to open up your mind to the possibility that in some sense, there are different levels of infinity. Um, not every infinite set is of the same size. Um, and so that's really the big deal here. Uh, so in this video, we're going to be looking at a lot of proofs. So this might be um, a little bit long. I encourage you to take breaks if you need to. Maybe watch a proof, look at it in your text, um, take a little break, and then come back to the video. That's okay. If you want to binge it, that's good too. All right, let's get started. So there's a lot of proofs in this section. I'd say it's mostly just theorems and proofs. Um, and rather than prove all of these sort of in detail in these videos, which would take a really long time, you'd be sitting here watching the video for probably a couple hours, what I'm going to do is just give you a proof sketch of a lot of these. I'm just going to give you an idea of why the proof works and talk a little bit about uh, a lot of these will involve functions. So talk a bit about the function and why, why that function was picked. Um, Right, so that's that's the idea with um, with this section. Um, I hope hopefully you'll take it upon yourself to go through and read the details of each proof. Um, maybe after I do a proof here, you can look through the details um, in the book and make sure you're understanding all the uh, the nitty gritty of the proof. All right, so let's get into this first one. Uh, so the first term we come across is this idea of a denumerable set. Um, so just look at the word denumerable of the numerals. Um, so that means it's it's the same size as the counting numbers, as the natural numbers. And that's exactly what the definition is. Uh, it has the same cardinality as the natural numbers. Remember this definition of same cardinality means that there exists a bijective function f from, in this case, from the natural numbers to whatever the set S is that we want to try and show that it's denumerable. So a set S is denumerable if we can do this, produce a bijective function. And so that's um, how this first proof will work, the theorem that uh, the integers are denumerable. So even though, right, like I said, this, this whole idea kind of blows my mind. Even though the natural numbers are a proper subset of the integers, they are still the same size. They have the same cardinality. That is, there's a bijective function between the natural numbers and the integers. Um, and remember, that is our, that is our uh, definition of same cardinality. So let's just talk about a proof sketch here. So why can we do this? Well, again, we need to produce this bijective function, so I'll write out what the function is. So here's how this is going to work. I'm going to put the natural numbers, the first few natural numbers up here for us to establish a pattern. <clears throat> Maybe I'll go up to 8. So this is n and f of n. And remember, so the deal here is I want to hit that, that every single integer needs to show up somewhere down here and I don't want to repeat any. So an exhaustive list that doesn't repeat any elements. Uh, and here's how I'll define it. So I'll send one to zero. 
because I know I got to hit zero at some point. I'll send two to one, three to negative one. Oops. Three to negative one, four to two, five to negative two, six to three, seven to negative three, and then eight. Well, can you see the pattern here? Where am I sending eight? I'm going to send it to four. And then nine, I'll send it negative four. And so uh, it's pretty clear just from the definition of the function that this will exhaust um, the integers and no integer is repeated. No integer is repeated. Um, and so the book will run you through a proof of that, that, you know, that everything actually is hit um, and that no integer is repeated. Um, and it's definitely good to see that, to see why that's true. But I think just from looking at this, you can see that this, this technique is going to work, right? Uh, so again, I encourage you to look at those details, but I think I'm going to leave it at this. That's, that's our function that works. And actually, in general, we can define our function. Our function can have an explicit form here. It's negative 1 to the n times n over 2 floor that we can actually get an explicit function for this. And this will be useful for proving that it really is bijective to have an explicit function. Okay, one other point in this proof um, sketch that I want to talk about, and this will help us in the next one, is that look at what I've really done here. I mean, I, on one hand, I do have a function from the natural numbers to the integers, but if I think of this as a sequence, so this is like a1, a2, a3, a4, and so on, a n in general, that what I really have is a sequence of integers, uh, and I'm using this function to produce it. So in some sense, I'm really just listing out the integers in such a way that it's exhaustive, right? It exhausts all the integers, and no integer is repeated. And when I can do that, what I really have is a function from the natural numbers to the integers. Um, there are many ways that you should you should think of a sequence really as a function from the natural numbers because remember the natural numbers index are sequences we start with a1 a2 a3 um, and we can get those through a function and so they're really they're really two of the same thing sequences and and uh, and functions from the uh, the natural numbers and so even though we're trying to find this bijective function it'll suffice to just show that we can list out all the elements of a set exhaustively without re repeating elements, that that's good enough, that'll do it. Um, right, and so since we can do this with the integers, since we can list out all the integers exhaustively without repeating, um, we can conclude that the natural numbers have the same cardinality as the integers. So that's the big takeaway, that's what this theorem is saying, is that those two sets have the same size. All right, let's take a look at another set, the positive rationals, and let's see um, if those also have the same size as the natural numbers. So the claim in this next theorem is that not only are the integers the same size as the uh, natural numbers, but the positive rationals are also the same size as the natural numbers. They're denumerable. So remember, this is saying that the positive rationals the same size as the natural numbers. Now that just seems, right, like I said, this, this has a lot of mind-blowing facts in it. Um, it just, it seems like there's a lot more rational numbers than there are natural numbers, right? Not only, um, right, right, I mean, we can do all numerators and denominators, um, and, and those can all be natural numbers. So how is it that these things are really the same? Well, let's look at a proof sketch and really figure out why uh, these two things have the same size. So I'll start with a proof sketch again. And remember what I was saying on the last slide that while in order to prove this, we need a bijective function, bijective function f from the natural numbers to the, the positive rationals, it suffices to just build an exhaustive list of uh, positive rational numbers, uh, such that no rational numbers uh, is repeated. It'll turn out that the whole not repeating something isn't, it's really not as important um, because we can just delete copies 
right? If, if something is repeated, we'll just remove it. Um, and at least in this case, that'll be okay. Um, uh, but what's really important is that it's an exhaustive list of positive rationals. So how can I list out the positive rationals, right? I mean, there is no, rationals aren't really a discrete set. At least they don't seem like it, right? There's no notion of next rational number. I mean, what's the next rational number after zero? One over a hundred? Well, no, we can find something between those. One over a billion? No, we can find something between those. Right? There's no smallest positive rational number. And in fact, we looked at a proof of that. So how can we possibly list all of these things out? It's, it's crazy. It's mind blowing. Uh, but anyway, let's see how to do it. Um, so again, we're gonna try and build a sequence. So it w the whole idea of the proof comes back to uh, this activity that I had you do in the very first week. I was sort of uh, foreshadowing this a little bit. I wanted you to see that table. Remember that table of positive rational numbers? I, I sort of presented it to you as the guise of like, hey, let's understand set builder notation and how we can actually define rational numbers and see why it works. Um, but really I was setting you up for this. So I'm gonna build that table. Hopefully um, it'll jog your memory if I start building the table. Remember the, the columns were the numerator and the rows were the denominator. And then in each cell, we would write uh, the column number divided by the row number. So, I mean, this is one benefit to this really quick class that we're having, the six week class, trying to pack, you know, 15 weeks of material into six weeks, is that, well, you didn't see this that long ago, so maybe you remember it pretty well, and that's nice. Uh, so remember, this would be like one, this would be like two over one or two, three, four, five, six, and that'll go on. Notice that in this row, we get all of the natural numbers. So just in this one row of the table, we get the natural numbers. This is just the weirdness of infinity. Even though the natural numbers are just one row of this huge infinite table, infinite number of rows, um, it has the same size as the natural numbers. It's crazy. This would be one half. This would be one again. So that'll present an issue because we just repeated a number. Three over two, this would be four over two. Oop, we repeated another one. Five over two, uh, six over two or three. Here we'd get what? One third, here we'd get one fourth, one fifth, one sixth, and so on. I know I've only shown you a finite number of cells, but I can't draw an infinite number of them. <laughs> two thirds, one again, right? We should get ones along this entire diagonal. So one is repeated an infinite number of times. Here we'd get four thirds, five thirds, um, six thirds or two. I am gonna keep going here because I just want a lot of, a lot of guys to work with uh, five fourths, six fourths, which is the same thing as three halves, which we've encountered before. Uh, two fifths, three fifths, four fifths, six fifths, um, one third, one half, two thirds, five sixths. Um, and so there's the start of our table. And we'd like to take this table and essentially break it down. We want to list out all of the elements that are in this table in a one dimensional array. So here we have, um, you know, infinite number of columns by an infinite number of rows. Uh, what we'd like to do is just have one row with an infinite number of columns. Seems crazy we should be able to do this, but nevertheless we can. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go by the diagonals. Um, and this'll, this argument will come up again. I'm gonna go by the diagonal. So I'm gonna start in this cell and I'll just draw an arrow here so that my first, um, my first positive rational will be one. That's what I'm gonna start with in my sequence. I'm gonna move down to the next row and take a diagonal up. And so this'll be one half and then two. This is telling my next two things in the sequence, one half, two. And now I'll go down to the next row, the third row, and do a diagonal up. And so I'll go one third. Now careful, I'm not gonna go one. So the, the rule I'm using here is I'm gonna keep doing these diagonals, uh, but anytime I, I would have repeated a number, I'm gonna just not include that in the sequence. So I'm not gonna include one in it. 
and I'm going to jump to the next one, three. All right, I'll move down to the next row and do the same thing. If I encounter a positive rational that I've seen before, I will not include it. One fourth, we haven't done that one yet. Two thirds, haven't done that one yet. Three halves, haven't done that one yet. Um, and four, haven't done that one yet. All right, let's move to the fifth one. So go down to the next row and look at the diagonal. All right, so looking at that diagonal, we have one fifth, one, oh, we've already done one half. So I'm not gonna include one half, right? One half appears here, so I'm gonna skip it. Uh, and then we get to the next one, one, oh, we've already seen one, so I'll skip that. Oh, we just got to two, I've already seen two, I'll skip that. So we had to skip a lot there. And actually the next one's five. Let's do one more diagonal. So now I'll go to the next one and do the same thing. I'll list them out, one sixth, Two fifths, we haven't seen that one yet, right? Three fourths, have we seen three fourths yet? Nope, I don't see it anywhere. Three fourths, four thirds, don't believe we've seen that one yet. Five halves, haven't seen that one, and then six. So that diagonal, we got to keep all of them. So we'll just keep doing this. And this is actually a well-defined um, sequence, right? I described to you the rules. Keep going down to the next diagonal, look at all of them. If you repeat any, don't include it, but include all the other ones. And so what this will do is we'll just keep going through the diagonal every single step and eventually we will get to every positive rational, right? If you give me a positive rational, I can tell you to go down to this, you know, go down to this row, look at the diagonal, it'll show up there. So eventually we hit every single positive rational number. Um, the, the book will tell you a little more detail about that, how we know for sure, but that's that's the main idea. And this whole business, right, I, I said it's not that important for us to, you know, have to not repeat things, because if we do repeat things, we'll just cross them off. As long as we don't repeat it an infinite number of times in a row, uh, we'll be good. But since I'm taking these diagonals, that'll never happen. Um, and so here is our list of positive rational numbers in a one-dimensional um, array. It's, it's, it's crazy. And so what this shows then, the sequence gives rise to a bijective function from the natural numbers to the positive rationals. Hence, we can conclude that the positive rationals have exactly the same size as the natural numbers and therefore the same size as the integers. Whoa. So in the last one, we just saw that the positive rationals have the same size as the natural numbers. Well, what about all the, the rationals? Well, in this theorem, we're claiming that actually, in fact, the entire set of rationals is the same size as the natural numbers. Um, so yeah, we don't really, we don't get to jump up in size just because we're including the negatives and zero. Um, and, and the idea will go like this. So in the last proof, we obtained this sequence. So let's, let me write down that sequence. So let a n be the sequence from the last slide. So that this sequence, every rational number appears somewhere in this sequence, right? And it doesn't repeat any rational numbers. And I'll build my, my sequence of all the rational numbers. Sorry, every positive rational shows up here in the sequence. And I'll build my sequence of rational numbers using that. And this is gonna use the exact same idea that I used to, to show that the integers could be listed out in this way, right? I alternated positive and negative. I started with zero and then just alternated back and forth. And so that's um, the same idea here. So I'll, I'll write this as like a, like a function. I'll build my table again, five, six, seven, eight. And I'll go like this. I'll go, I'll start with zero. And then I'll go, uh, instead of doing one negative one, I want to use my sequence. So I'll go a1, negative a1, a2, negative a2, a3, negative a3, a4, and so on. And so not only is every a n hit again, right? A n is a is a subsequence of this sequence or a, of the sequence that I built here, uh, but also the negative a n's are a subsequence of it, and zero is included in the sequence. And so this will hit every single rational number um, at some point. Hence, we have a bijective function from the natural numbers to the rationals.
and that's what we can conclude is that they have the same size as the natural numbers. So you might be wondering, it seems like all these infinite sets just have the same size. Hmm. So I want you to keep thinking about that question I just asked. Does every infinite set just have the same size? It's certainly starting to seem like that. No matter what I'm given, I'm able to produce this, you know, exhaustive list of its elements. Um, so keep thinking about that. Uh, but before I answer your question, I want to present this following theorem. So every infinite subset of a denumerable set is also denumerable. So given a set that has the same size as the natural numbers, um, and the infinite subset of that will also be the same size as the natural numbers. And this isn't too hard to imagine, right? If I have a, right, I, I know my sequence has the same, or I know my set has the same size as the natural numbers, so I have some sequence of it all listed out. And what I'll do is I'll look at my infinite subset and I'll cross off everything that's not in that infinite subset. I'll just cross them off of the sequence and sort of collapse my sequence down. It'll still be infinite because it's an infinite subset and it'll still be exhaustive since I exhaust the bigger set. Um, and so that's one way to get that sequence. I won't show you all the, the, uh, the details here, but that's, that's essentially it. Now this has some consequences, right? There's a lot of sets that we know. We know, right, we have the natural numbers, we have the evens, we have the odds, we have these rational numbers. So the consequence of this is, I'll just list a few of the things out, right? This tells us that the even numbers have the same cardinality as the natural numbers. The odd numbers have the same size as the natural numbers. That these, really I should list it off as just one long string of, it, uh, of equality. So natural numbers, um, yeah, I'll start with natural numbers. What all has the same size as the natural numbers? Well, the even, uh, the odds, the evens, uh, the integers, um, things like multiples of three, multiples of five, any infinite subset of the integers will work, will have the same size. So there's a lot of things we could put there. We know the positive rationals have the same size. Therefore, the negative rationals have the same size. Uh, as well as the entire set of rationals has the same size. And then any infinite subset of uh, the, the rationals would also have the same size as them. Um, and so the, the book lists a few of those, like rational numbers where the top and the bottom are both odd integers, something like that, uh, would be an infinite subset of the rational numbers, and that would still have the same size. So all of these things have the same size. So again, we're led to this, this question, does anything have a bigger size than these sets? Looks like rational numbers are sort of the biggest thing we've able, been able to prove are the same size as the natural numbers, hence they weren't really bigger after all. Um, but what about jumping up a level? What's bigger than the rational numbers? Remember, we know that the rational numbers also sit inside of the real numbers. And in particular, the real numbers between zero and one, that's a proper subset of the real numbers. And so what we're actually gonna do in the next slide is take a look at the real numbers between zero and one. All right. Let's look at that. All right, I keep leading you on a little bit. Before we talk about uh, these real numbers between zero and one, we need to talk about decimal expansions. So how can we write out an arbitrary real number between zero and one? Well, we can do it with decimal expansions. And here's one other really mind-blowing thing. This is where I'll start with this, um, is that, so something like, all right, I'll just say it. 0.99999 repeating. So nines all the way down, nines to infinity. So there's no room to add anything else. That this is really the same thing as one. That that's really just another way to write the natural number one is 0.99999999 repeating. All right. Whenever I teach this, that's that's a mind-blowing fact that, that that should be true, and typically people don't believe me. And so, of course, I have a few arguments here to prove my point. There's a couple different ways to explain why this is true. So probably my favorite way, uh, but maybe not your favorite. My favorite way is this. If two numbers are different, then we should be able to find a number between them. So let me write that out. If A and b are real numbers and so maybe you claim 0.999 is smaller 
than one, and A is less than B, then there exists um, C in the real numbers such that A is less than C is less than B. So if the uh, point being, if two numbers are different, I should be able to find something between them. So if you claim that 0.999 repeating is the same thing as one, then you should be able to produce this number between them. Can you do that? What would it look like? Well, you can't. 0.999 repeating has all nines. You can't stick, say, a zero at the end of this because there is no end of it. It's nines all the way down. There's no room to stick anything in there. That really, these two things are exactly the same thing because there's nothing in between them. That, that's my sort of favorite, favorite argument, but the one that uh, students typically latch on to and like the best is this. So we're all very comfortable with the fact that one third is the same thing as 0.333 repeating. Okay, well, I'm just going to take this and multiply by three on both sides. So three times one third. On one hand, you know, three over three is one, so we should get one there. Uh, but if I multiply this repeating decimal by three, three times 0.3333 repeating, well, I could just take that, you know, one decimal at a time. This would be 0.9999 repeating. And so there we have it again. One is the same thing as 0.9999. Uh, you could do this, this very similar argument um, uh, with geometric series, which we didn't really talk about this, but if you've got Calc 2, uh, this you can write this uh, repeating decimal 0.999 repeating or 0.333 repeating um, as an infinite series and show that it converges to um, to one in the case of all nines or one third in the case of all threes. And so that's kind of crazy. I don't know. Go find someone to talk to about it. Share this knowledge with someone. See what they think. Try and argue your position that these are really the same thing. Um, I don't know. I think it's wild. At any rate, it seems like there are two decimal expansions for this number one, right? One has two decimal expansions, one that just has a zero at the end and one that has all nines. But this will happen a lot of, in a lot of cases. So something like um, one half can be done like this. It's 0.5, but at the same time, we could also write it as 0.499999 repeating. Same thing with like one tenth. So some numbers, can have this infinite repeating nines, and some just have a bunch of zeros at the end. So that's one fact I'll have to address in the next one uh, that I just wanted to mention. Uh, and then the other thing I'll say is how can we represent an arbitrary real number uh, between zero and one? So I'll just focus on, on things between zero and one. So let A be in this set of real numbers between zero and one. Right. I'll just write out the set builder for this. This is the set of all real numbers such that um, zero is less than or equal to X is less than or equal to one. Just to be clear about what we're looking at there. And then anything in there. So A is in there. Then let A sub, let's call it A sub N be the nth uh, decimal for A. So we would have like a sub one. Well, okay, let me say like this. Then we can write a is point a sub one, a sub two, a sub three, a sub four. We'll concatenate all these a sub n's and put it into the decimal. So something like um, one third, we can write this as, right? My a sub one would be three. My a sub two would be three my a sub three would be three. It's just, these a sub n's are really just a way of keep, keeping track of the decimal. So 0 0.3333, 3, 3, repeating like that. So I've concatenated all these together um, and that forms the decimal expansion for this, for this a, uh, and in particular one third. And we can do this with anything. Um, but the fact that two, des two numbers might have uh, two different decimal representations, well, how we'll get around that, we'll just say that, um, will favor the ones with um, the all nines. We'll favor the decimal expansion that has all nines. If we, if we run into a case like this where they could all, either be all nines or all zeros, we'll pick the one with all nines. So my a sub, a sub n's will just be nines to infinity. Um, and so that's the deal. That's, that'll be our rule. 
All right, so we've talked a bit about decimal expansions. This is how, how we can write out an arbitrary real number between zero and one. Uh, let's get to a proof of the fact that these real numbers between zero and one are actually bigger than the natural numbers. They're bigger than the rational numbers. They have strictly larger cardinality. So let's take a look at that. So the way to do this, the way to show that these real numbers between zero and one are not denumerable, remember being denumerable means there's a bijective function, or on the other hand, um, an exhaustive list of the elements of the set. Um, that's denumerable, so not denumerable would mean that we can't do that. So this is a good example of when a proof by contradiction might work. Let's assume we can find um, a bijective function, proof sketch, and this is by contradiction. So assume there exists a bijective f from the natural numbers to this set of real numbers 0 and 1. And then we'll show that there's a contradiction here. All right, so that's that's the start of this proof. We assume we have this bijective function, and hence we have an exhaustive list of uh, real numbers between zero and one. Uh, so this, I'll say, this produces a sequence a sub n of all real numbers um, between zero and one. So everywhere, so if I pick any real number between zero and one, it'll show up somewhere in this list. This is the claim anyway. If these things really have the same size, that would have to be true. And I'll show that this leads to some nonsense. Okay, so I have this sequence, so let me write out. So I, have, I would have like a1, a2, up to an, and, and continuing on. And since each one of these is a real number between zero and one, that means I can write out its decimal expansion. So I'll write, let, let a, i, j be the, um, be the jth decimal in the expansion of a sub i. So my a sub i's are my real numbers, and then for each real number, I know I have a decimal expansion. And so I have an a i, you know, one, an a i two, an a i three. For every single i, I have this this infinite list of decimals. And again, we're gonna pick if if a real number can be expressed with all nines as a decimal or expressed with all zeros for its decimal. I'll favor the one with all nines. I'll pick that one. And so that's my rule to produce this list. Um, so uh, maybe let me just say a quick example of that. So like if um, if a sub one is I don't know point four nine 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 repeating. So if a sub one is a half, and a sub two is like point three four seven nine two, six, I don't know, something like that. Then what, what would my a sub i j's be? So a sub a one, uh, one would be four, a one two would be nine, a one three would be nine, and so on. That would all be nines from there on out. So a sub a one four would be nine. And then a sub two, so this would be the decimal expansion for a sub two. So a sub two one would be three, a sub two two would be four, a sub two, three uh, would be seven, um, and so on. And so that's, and remember, I'll have an infinite list of these. So I'll have like an a sub one million, uh, and, then, and then because that's a real number, I'll have a sub one million one, a sub one million two, and so on and so on. And what this will do is this will give me a table. So I'm gonna go to one more slide because I've kind of out of room here, and I'll describe what we can do with this once we have it. Okay, so, Remember, we have we have this sequence of real numbers of real numbers between zero and one that's exhaustive and no number 
repeated. And then we talked about how to represent the decimals for that. So for each one of these, I'm going to write out its decimals. Um, sorry, phone was going off. Um, so here's what I'll do. I'll make, I'll make a table out of this. Um, so on the left-hand side, I'll have, uh, how should I do this? I'll write it like this. So a sub one is a one, one, or decimal a one, one, a one, two, a one, three, and so on. Maybe I'll go one more, a one, four, and then a sub two will be a two, one, a two, two, a two, three, a two four, my a sub three, I can write out its decimal expansion, a three one, a three two, a three three, a three four. So I can build this sort of table here um, where the cell in uh, row N column, column M is the nth real number, uh, the nth digit of that, nth decimal of that one. And what I'm gonna do here my goal is to show that this thing actually isn't bijective, right? The claim that it is bijective, but I'm going to show that something fails. And in particular, I'm going to show that there's some real number. So I'll write this as a claim. Claim there exists um, a real number B in this set 0 to 1 such that uh, B is not equal to A sub N for any N. That is, it doesn't show up in our sequence. Of course, the claim, right, we started with the assumption that it does. We started with the assumption that there was this bijective function, hence a sequence. Um, and we're going to show that actually it doesn't do its job. And so what I'm going to do is, again, I'm going to look at the diagonal of this table. And I'll, and I'll look at the whole diagonal of the thing. And so I'm going to build my real number based off of this diagonal. So there's lots of ways I could do this. So define b by so in order to define b i can just tell you what the decimal expansion is right so so in general what i'm going to do is the nth decimal for b i mean it's going to be a piecewise defined thing i'm going to let it be how about two there's a couple ways i could define this that's going to work how about i let it be two if the nth digit of the nth real number is one and let's let it be one if it's not. So what I'll do to build this number, I'll start here. I'll look at a one, one, the first decimal of the first real number. If it's a one, I'll make B sub one, two. If it's not one, I'll make it be one. And so B sub 1 is different than A and N, right? Um, that's, that's what this function thing is doing. It's guaranteeing that my nth decimal digit for B will be different than A sub N, N. And so I'll keep going down. I'll look at A sub 2, 2. Is that a 1 or is it not 1? If it's 1, I'll let B sub 2 be 2. If it's not 1, I'll let it be 1. And I'll just keep going down. And so that's a way to construct a real number from this big list of real numbers. But, but then if, if B sub, if the nth digit of B differs by A sub one in the first digit, it's definitely not A sub one, right? The first digit of B is not the first digit of A, uh, of A1. I defined it to be like that. So it's not the first digit of A1, so it can't be A1. But then the second digit of B, I define that to be different than the second digit of A2. So it can't be A2. It can't be A1. It can't be A2. It can't be A3 by the same reasoning, right? The third digit of B will be different than the third digit of A3. So it can't be A3, it can't be A4, and by how I define this, B is not equal to A sub N for any N. Okay, but that's an issue, right? Because we claimed that 
every single real number between zero and one shows up somewhere in the sequence. And we just produced this natural, this, um, this real number B, right? We know it'll be between zero and one from how we defined it. It's decimal expansions are either, it's either one or two. So it can't be bigger than one or less than zero. So we just produce this, this number B that doesn't show up anywhere on the list. Hence, um, uh, the A sub N's do not exhaust the real numbers between zero and one. But that was the claim that they did, that we had this bijective function and hence could do that. And so that's a contradiction. And so what follows then is that there can't be any bijective function between them, uh, but certainly the real numbers um, have more. It can't be less, right? We know that those two sets, the natural numbers and the real numbers between zero and one don't have, um, Right, the real numbers between zero and one can't possibly be less than uh, the natural numbers in cardinality. And so the only case left is that it has to be more. So what we conclude here is that the size of the set of real numbers between zero and one is strictly larger, that there's no way to find a bijective function, hence it's strictly larger cardinality than the natural numbers, and therefore the integers or the rationals. And so this is our next level of infinity are the real numbers between zero and one, that this is sort of bigger than any set we've seen so far. Even though it's just between zero and one, the fact that the real numbers, that it's a continuous set, uh, means that it has bigger cardinality. So again, I encourage you to look through the details of the proof. Maybe that'll explain it a little better than I did, uh, but hopefully this gives you a good idea of why uh, the, there are more numbers that we can really say there's more numbers in the real numbers between zero and one than there are rationals or naturals or integers. So we've seen now there really are two sizes of infinity that which describes the natural numbers, the integers and the rationals, and the other size of infinity, which describes these real numbers between zero and one. And so this is gonna give rise to a new definition. And this is for countable and uncountable. So a set is called countable if it's either denumerable or if it's finite. So we'll just take all the finite sets and the ones with this first level of infinity, this first size of infinity, the natural numbers, the rationals, and we'll call those all countable. And this makes sense, right? Because uh, being the same size as the natural numbers means we can produce the sequence, this exhaustive sequence of the set, and hence we can kind of go one by one and count. Uh, and so there's this notion of next um, natural number uh, or next integer or even next rational number, which we now know makes sense. Um, and then on the other side of that are like the real numbers between zero and one, which we can't list out. Any attempt to list them out will miss some real number as we showed in the last proof. We call these sets uncountable. And so if it's not countable, it's, it, it's said to be uncountable. Uh, it's very creative. <laughs> So here's a theorem that goes along with that. Every set that contains an uncountable subset is itself uncountable. And I'm gonna do that without proof. Um, and I'll just sort of let you think about this and maybe you can look at the book if you want to and understand why that should be true. But if we have um, an uncountable set, any, if I add anything more to that, it'll still be uncountable. It's kind of obvious, but this gives us a lot more things that are uncountable, right? We know that the, uh, the real numbers between zero and one are uncountable since we showed they were not denumerable and not finite, are uncountable. And since those real numbers between zero and one are a subset, a proper subset, doesn't matter, a uh, proper subset of the real numbers, we can claim that the real numbers are also uncountable. And so the same would be true of say the complex numbers or um, Hamilton's quaternions. Uh, those would all have the same cardinality as the real numbers or, well, we can't say that it's the same cardinality, but at least they're uncountable. Uh, and actually those ones I just uh, mentioned do have the same cardinality. We can show that the complex numbers are actually in one-to-one -one correspondence with the real numbers, hence they have the same size. Um, uh, and so a lot of those will have the same size. A lot are at the, that level two infinity. And actually this is called um, Aleph, Aleph one. Uh, so R 
and the complex number or uh, complex numbers, as well as any any closed uh, or open subset of real numbers, all have the same uh, cardinality uh, as the real numbers. Um, oh, what was I going to say? Um, so. Th in terms of levels of infinity, the book doesn't talk about this, but like um, there are symbols for this. So like natural numbers, we, we want to get away from the symbol infinity now because we know that there's multiple levels of infinity. Uh, and so what the symbol people used is uh, Aleph, which is a Hebrew letter. And it looks like kind of a squiggly N, Aleph not. So this is sort of the first level of infinity that when we write just infinity, what we really mean is Aleph not. Um, and this is so the same as the, the integers and the rational numbers. These are all the size of that is aleph naught. Uh, that's this describing this cardinality. These all have cardinality aleph one. And so that begs the question: Is there anything bigger than the real numbers or the complex numbers? Is there anything bigger than aleph one? Well, hopefully this notation kind of hints at the fact that, yeah, there is. There is an Aleph 2, there's an Aleph 3, and so on. But there's lots of cardinals that describe infinity, and each is a different size. So let's take a look at, at how we know there are sets bigger than the real numbers. All right, so how do we know? What is the biggest set? Is there a biggest set that can, contains everything? Is there a biggest cardinality? Well, no because every set has a smaller cardinality than its power set. So if I give you a set S, then that will always have strictly smaller, even if S is infinite, it'll have strictly smaller cardinality than its own power set. Now this is, a, this is actually a really cool proof. Um, I, I encourage you to look through this in the text. I feel like it's going to take too much time for me to do it in this video. Uh, so I'll just kind of say that, yep, this is true. The power set always has a bigger cardinality than the set itself. And so what this means is, so here we have, right, we start with like the natural numbers, and that has strictly less cardinality than the real numbers. Uh, and that will have, so what a bigger set than the real numbers would be the power set of the real numbers. So the set of all subsets of real numbers is bigger than the real numbers. And if I want something bigger than that, I'll take the power set of that thing. Why not? I can keep taking power sets. I can keep producing these, these sets of subsets of a thing, right? And so that'll have smaller than that. And so we can keep going. And so while this would be like, I was using the Alephs, this would be like Aleph 1, this would be like Aleph 2, this would be like Aleph 3, and so on. Um, we can always get a bigger set. There is no biggest cardinality. And so as far as number of sizes of infinity, there are an infinite number. <laughs> I, I love this result, right? There, <laughs> there are an infinite number of infinite sizes. And so the next question, now that we know that there's different sizes of infinity, well, how many sizes are there? We know it's infinite. There's an infinite number of sizes of infinity, but describe the infinity. Is it countable? Is it uncountable? I'll let that, I'll leave that one up to you. Can we possibly describe the amount of different sizes of infinity? That's my question to you. Feel free to post that on the discussion board if you want um, and try and come to some solution for that. I'm sure there's some resources out there online that'll lead you to an answer to that question. Can we describe the number of sizes of infinity? Ah, it's very meta, it's very meta. Um, so do I have anything to add to this? Yes, I do. One more thing to add, um, I'll just, I'll write it out here. There's something called the continuum hypothesis. Now, the, what the continuum hypothesis is, it's an axiom. Remember I mentioned this set ZFC before when, we, when I was talking about weirdness of sets? Well, here we have more weirdness of sets, more like weirdness of infinities. Um, and so while the Z and the F, this stands for zermelo frankel the people that sort of invented this axiomatic system to, to define sets, the C stands for this thing called um, the axiom of choice. 
Um, and the axiom of choice, I can't describe it here, but it has something to do with this um, continuum hypothesis. So what the continuum hypothesis says is that there are no sizes of infinity between the natural numbers and the real numbers. So there's no cardinalities between aleph zero and aleph one. Now that is not a question that can be answered. The, the question of, is there, a, is there an infinite cardinality between these two sets? There's something bigger than the natural numbers, but smaller than the real numbers. That question can't be answered by mathematics. We can't answer it. And so what we have is this thing called the continuum hypothesis. And it's a, it's a hypothesis. It's something that's added to these axiomatic systems. It says there are no infinite sets between the natural numbers and the real numbers. That it really does just go LF0 to LF1. It's unanswerable, but we'll sort of make that hypothesis. We'll say, okay, whatever, let's just, let's just say there is. Because it's, and this is again, very meta, we can prove that you can't prove that. <laughs> we can prove that there's no way to prove if there's a set between the natural numbers and the real numbers. It's wild. The further you get down into math, the more meta things get like this. And maybe at some point, if you want to keep at it, you can understand that proof of why, why we can't even say. We say it's independent of our axiomatic system to conclude that there's an infinite set between those two cardinalities. It's just, it's something we, we can never know the answer to it. It's wild. And so that's what the continuum hypothesis, it, it just answers it. And it's, it's an assumption. It's basically saying, let's just assume Let's just assume that there isn't, because that makes things easier. <laughs> and we know that it doesn't matter one way or the other. It's not gonna affect anything. Um, okay, that's all I'll say about this. Feel free to look up the continuum hypothesis. Maybe read the wiki page on it. It's, it's real fun stuff. There's some really cool things going on here. I hope you enjoyed it a little bit. Again, this is probably my favorite subject. It, blow, it even blows my mind when I talk about it again. It's, my mind just does backflips, like what, what is going on here? So anyway, I think it's fun. Hopefully you had a little fun too. Um, I'll leave you with that for this chapter. See you next time.